Donc on va retourner à l'analyse des données pour se mettre en appétit avec euh, Madame Christine Bennett, qui est la collègue de Jim Handler, qui nous a fait des présentations hier matin et hier après-midi. Donc euh, Madame Bennett est directeur associée de l'Institut pour l'exploration et l'application des données. Elle est professeure dans deux départements, en mathématiques et en informatique, au Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Donc sa recherche, c'est sur, justement, on en a parlé tout à l'heure, euh, retrouver de l'information à partir des données pour construire des modèles prédictifs, descriptifs et visualiser des données. Alors, euh, je laisse la parole à Christine. Bonjour, ça va bien <laughs> oui. Okay, that's all my French. So, okay, so today I'm going to talk about my experiences uh, working with artificial intelligence in the semiconductor manufacturing industry. Uh, specifically, I've worked with um, Global Foundries, which is a, a, a chip foundry. It's located in New York, and they um, make chips for many different people, right? Um, So this is work that was sponsored by Global Foundries and also by the Na National Science Foundation and also the Rensselaer Idea. It's the work with my students. If you need any students that are looking for jobs, Ridwan Alikba, Andre Vargas, Alex New, Miao Q, and John Erickson I also work with. Let's start by talking about what the problem is. Okay, so um, if you go to... Uh, The, the factory in Malta, it's a huge clean room. It's like the size of a football field, even bigger. It's like two football fields. And it's full of these machines that are doing steps produce these semiconductor wafers. You can see the wafer there. And it's like, you know, like a CD, and they keep adding stuff and etching it through these processes. And it's all lined with robots. So on the ceiling, you can barely see it, but there's these tracks, and there's little boxes. They're called foops. And um, there's maybe like 20 wafers in there. And they're actually, the clean room isn't clean enough. These wafers are kept at a vacuum and they're moved around and they go into the next uh, tool or sometimes we call it a chamber and they go and get their stuff done in. And uh, so the data I worked with, um, our, our job was to do quality control uh, for etching, so an, an, an epitaxy process. And um, so we had data um, for one process for half a year. It was 55,000 files. You know, I mean, it just, so what happens is it goes through this procedure. Um, it, there's a control system that's running it, so it has all this streaming sensor data that's collected, and it's used to control the system and also for quality control. And then they're also testing the wafers as they go along and they're checking to see if they're any good. I mean, after the, along the way and at the end of the 100 steps. And then what happens is sometimes things go awry and they're not right, and then some engineer or technician has to figure out why. So they have this trace data, and it looks something like that, like this uh, picture here. Whoopsie, I don't see how I point. How do I point? This one's point. Yeah, oop, I gotta go back. This is the data. This is actually streaming data. Those lines are different ones. And here we're seeing this, the white and to dark is time. It's shifting over time as the process is getting messed up. And, um, and then they have to figure out why. And I met a, an engineer, and when they have a difficult problem, he literally spends a week formatting the files to find the problems. And he gave that to me and my students once it was all formatted, and they could find it in you know, an hour. So, I mean, they spend a huge amount of effort to try to figure this out. They're kind of complex problems. You have to know how to represent it. And then you have to take an action. So this is actually a picture of a valve getting gummed up, and it's causing this process to ship. And this is affecting the, uh, the performance of the chip. And you can see it's all gummed up, and then they have to fix it and all that. So, so our job for this process was to uh, detect and diagnose the anomalies in real time. So they have this streaming sensor data, and, um, and there's about 20 sensors that are streaming, making these 55,000 files. And there's also what's called metrology. Metrology is ground truth. They, they measure it. They have to use lasers and stuff. It's very difficult. I didn't mention this is all at 14 and 28 nanometers, so it's very small, no specks of deaths allowed. Um, so we have this ground truth data. And 
um, they have systems that work quite well for finding anomalies when they're univariate, when something goes out of control and they have limits. So like here, um, you're seeing the metrology, that red line, that's the top one. The red line actually represents being in, in spec, but you can see the process is drifting. And this is actually metrology um, measurements of critical dimensions. They never tell me what they are. I'm not supposed to know. But um, as it's changing over time, and you can see there's kind of this drift. This is the distance from the center of the wafer. So we can see there's, there's starting to be problems. So we would want to find the anomalies that are associated by this. We have to do it in, in roughly real time using multivariate data from the sensors. We're not really allowed to use this data because it's acquired much later. We can use it for validation to see if we're on the right track and we're finding actual changes that are associated with changes in the wafers. And this... Um, process should find the anomalies, and it's also got to help the engineers um, decide what to do. Because like, if I just say your process isn't working, that's not terribly helpful, right? Are they supposed to shut it down because I said that? I mean, even if my thing is really good, I, they're not going to do that. I mean, each one of these wafers costs about $5,000. It's doing like one every 20 minutes. Uh, so we can't just shut down the line. So we actually have to produce an interactive report that helps the engineers diagnose the problem and understand what's wrong and help guide them in troubleshooting and repairs. So that's our goal. And specifically, we need to do this for processes that are changing. It's, it's a foundry. It's doing many different processes for many different people. Um, so uh, we have to be able to adapt for new machines. And we'd like to be able to this to work across the whole fab. The fab is the fabrication plant. And there's literally hundreds of these machines running at a time, and they're all doing different things, and they're all following different recipes. So we want some very flexible, automated processes just going to be able to that. And we're looking for problems um, for things that are actually working. I mean, the things are in spec, but in the end, they're out of spec. They're not quite as good. Like, the yield on the chip is low. So it isn't like... Um, that there's already alarms that something's wrong. These are more subtle things we're looking, and they're more like multivariate relationships we're trying to find. And we're going to try to find differences that are meaningful. So, um, so the key thing that we exploit to do this is, okay, we have these wafers, and so you have to understand the process. The wafers are going through like 100 different steps on this robotics. They actually travel five miles while they're being manufactured within this facility, um, and they're going through all these different processes. We have the streaming data, and the streaming data is following recipes that are made up by the engineers, and um, the control system, the recipes are implemented by control systems. So this is a very artificial problem. I mean, it's all created by humans. Um, there's this control system. Control systems uh, are uh, made by engineers. Engineers study them. We can model them. We know how they work. They have causal models. I don't know if we have any engineers here, but you probably learned about control systems, right, and how they work. And in fact, they're not even hard control so, uh, systems. Actually, everything we do here is a PID controller. It's a proportional integral derivative controller. It's a very common controller. It's believed to be used in like 50% of all manufacturing. They use these controllers. And ours are even PI controllers, right? So, and, and actually, I don't actually know what the controllers are doing, but you can see evidence of their work. So um, this is what data from a PI controller, this is actual data. And, um, what you're seeing here, when you do a control, there's a process variable, like power, and then there's a, a, a control variable, I'm sorry, there's a process variable like temperature and like a control variable that's like power. And it's like baking, right? You're trying to hit baking, and what happens is it, 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 you know, it overshoots and undershoots, and it's trying to get to the steady temperature by turning on and off the power, and that's a control system. And that, this is a picture of what that data looks like. This is uh, one of the chambers and one of the recipes, and you're seeing a bunch of wafers. These are all the measurements through time, and the, um, the bottom variable, the x is the process variable, and the y is control variable, and it has this very distinct shape because they're kind of doing this dance to control the system for this one step of this recipe on one machine. And um, so we can look at that, and the colors are different chambers. Those are different machines. They're supposed to be all the same, but they aren't. Um, one reason they might be not the same is that they're not quite calibrated the same, so things are going to be a little different. 
Um, so we have to, it doesn't, just because they're different doesn't mean they're wrong, but you can see that in some cases the shape is just wrong. You know, like if you kind of see those gold ones, they seem like to have be fundamentally different than the other ones. So we can see in this kind of uh, swirl of data that there's clearly some anomalies occurring, and we want to find the ones that are associated with the metrology that are associated with pure, uh, poor yields. Okay, so we have to figure out which variations are there? Um, what is normal variation? What is variation that's significant and indicates a problem with, with um, yield? OK, so could we use deep learning? Well, sure, we got enough data. We got a lot of data. Kind of, we have enough data. Um, you know, we could use deep learning. It's very powerful. It's very flexible. Uh, but the problem is it's only correlative. I mean, I, I guess. Um, we, we might want, we know a lot about the causality here. We know that, you know, power controls temperature. Um, another problem with it is it doesn't really know anything about our domain. We know a lot about our domain. You know, this is engineering. You know, engineers have been studying this for years. They know what they're doing. They know what the parameter means. The deep learning is not going to know that. And, um, and then another thing about the deep learning is it's hard to explain. It's, it's going to come up with some prediction, like, oh, this seems weird. But we have to explain it because they have to act. So we want to tr transform these predictions into actionable insights. So um, that's kind of hard to do with deep learning. I mean, people are working on it, but it's hard to know. And um, another problem is it needs lots of data. In, one, in some ways, we have lots of data. But you can imagine, as you start up a new process, you actually don't have much data. Because for every new process, if you have to retrain from scratch and can't reuse old data, um, then there's really not very much, because you might have only done a few hundred rafers, and there's not a lot of data. So there kind of is a lot of data, and there isn't. Um, the other thing about this is that um, we're looking for a purely automated process that could be used over and over again, because you know this fab is doing, it has hundreds of these machines, and they're doing hundreds of recipes, and we need to do all of them at once, right? We have to make something that's scalable and usable at the, uh, the fab level. So, um, so if you need a, a, a skilled data scientist to hand tune one of these, that's not going to work, right? We need something that you can just use and everybody gets and, and can be reused over and over and over again in an efficient way. So I'm sure you could make a, a deep learning network. Somebody very clever could figure it out. But I'm not sure it would meet our needs. OK. so. Um, another thing we have is that we have all this engineering work, and they have what I would call a white box model. This is a mechanistic model of how a PID controller works. It's pretty close to reality. It has a set of um, ordinary differential equations that characterize it. And it's a causal model. You know, you change this, you get that. Um, and uh, I guess, um, so it's great. You can see that it makes those little swirlies like we just saw. I can generate them. That's on simulated data. I can understand actually what they mean in the parameter space of where the engineer is setting that. You know, they're turning control knobs. And in that control knob space, I can describe exactly what the actions are and maybe how they should change things. But the problem is you don't really use these for um, data. You use this to simulate and understand stuff, but not really to generate data. So it's not that helpful here. And also, the other reason it's not helpful is because our control systems are actually much more complicated than this, and I don't actually know what they are, because they're different in every machine, and I don't really have that information. I mean, it's obvious that I know that some variables are like power that are control variables, and others are temperature and pressure that are um, process variables, but I don't really know this exact model. OK, so our solution is to do what we call gray box model. So we want to exploit these kind of models that we have, but, uh, but that the white box models that are mechanistic models of, of how a control system work. But we also want to combine them with purely data-driven black box approaches. So here, let's look at what the data is. This is an actual data, some kind of power. And it's going through time. This is a sensor. And we're watching this sensor run. And the colors are actually different steps. So the, as it goes through the rainbow, it's different steps of the process. And each, each step is a, a, a one little control system step. It's like trying to you know, get it up to temperature, or it's trying to keep it at temperature. And it's, it's, it's a, uh, the sensor run, the control system runs it until it achieves its goal, and then it starts the next program. So it, it has different length time. You don't know exactly how it's sampled, and, but you could see it. And then it, it samples, the sensor samples 
during their process, and I hope you can see this, but there's, there's a bunch of dots here. This is a sensor through time. And you can see that it has this very distinct shape there. It's a damped harmonic oscillator. And that's because it comes from a troll, control system. And it turns out if you have a control system, all kinds of control systems, if you look at one variable time, they make these oscillator things, right? They oscillate trying to achieve their goal. And so the data always looks like that. And, um, for everything that we look like. So we can understand the behavior in, of the data from our white box model, from our causal a mathematical model of the world actually is quite illuminating about um, what we're going to observe and what we should observe. OK, so the idea here is that um, we know the data should trace a curve, so we actually fit the curves. So instead of looking at the raw sensor data that's sampled irregularly through time, we actually fit the curve. And you can see here's one curve. It's much easier to see because it's much easier to see. And you can see this is one wafer, this pink one, and this is another one. And you can see that the waf wafers have shifted. And this one is not as tall as the one. It's got less amplitude, right? So we've, we're seeing a change there. Right? So now we characterize things by taking each of the little recipe steps, and we actually fit this curve that we know that exists from the, um, our mathematical models of our world, and it fits well, right? And if it doesn't fit well, it means our, our, the world is not following our model, which is bad, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I could give you an example, like the, you know, the Boeing crashed using uh, some system. If you had a model of that system, right? Uh, the Boeing plane, right, they've been crashing uh, because a bad sensor. If you had a model of sensors and all the sensors are agreeing and this one's off, then you know it's messed up and you should do something, right? So having a model and comparing yourself to the model of what you know is actually quite valuable information, right? And, and that's what my deep learning doesn't know. It doesn't know that I have all this background information about engineering and how things work and how uh, physical systems work, you know? Okay, so we can see if we characterize this by how we fit this curve to it, then we can see that it's, it has, um, it's had a change of amplitude. It seems to be damping more, and it's shifted, right? So now we've translated this arbitrary stream of data to something that an engineer can understand, you know? Amplitude's off. It's oscillating too much. And that has engineering meaning to them. And actually, you can actually translate it back, reverse engineer it, to the parameters of the system um, that they set. OK, so I, I'm a mathematician, so I have to put some math in, so I'm sorry. But uh, so there's an ordinary differential equation. And if you solve this using a Laplace transfer, you, you get this. So you get that all the process and control variables are going to follow that equation on the bottom. That is the equation of a linearly driven um, harmonic oscillator. And you can show that no matter what parameters you pick, that's going to fit. I mean, it might be that it's flat or something like that, but any data you get out of those control system is going to look like that. So you should look for that and fit that and find that. And so that's our Graybacks model. We fit that. And you can see here is a, here's another example here, right? Um, you can see these are shifted and changed. These are different wafers. Each color is a different wafer, right? And, um, and we've, we've moved into a, a, this parameter space where we characterize things by their amplitude, how damp they are, what's their frequency, what's their phase shift, what's their slope, and what's their vertical shift, right? And we also have an idea of, like, do you even fit this curve at all? Because if you're messed up, like your sensor's gone bad, you won't even fit it, right? OK, and these, these parameters are actually in terms of the parameters of the controller. These, these K things, these are actually what the um, engineer sets to change the system. So you can actually reverse the engineering back from the data and understand the sensor's settings, his control knobs, or her control knobs that she sets, right? So this is a great way to look at things, and this is very informative. OK, and it turns out, um, you know, you can do all the math, and you can simulate the data. And no matter what you get, it will exactly produce this. And you can see that um, this example here is like the simulated data. Um, we have a, 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 the uh, control variable on the left and the process variable on the right. And you can see you get these different behaviors. And we, and we actually observe all these behaviors in our data. 
In our data, if you look at them one at a time, you know, this one's got this oscillatory going up. This one's going like this. You have these flat ones. That's also modeled by this. A flat one is just all these things are zero, but you only have y, right? So it can model a very broad array of signals and actually characterize what's going on. So every trace data that we see in all of those 55,000 files fits that model roughly, right? Even though we don't have the control system right, right perfect, we know the univariate model that we should see, and we can fit that, and that tells you something about the original system. Okay, so, so then what we do is we actually use um, Bayesian regression. We fit the, uh, bunches of wafers at a time, and we characterize um, the shape of each wafer and, and this is a, the wafer in a recipe in a single step. And, and then we get these different shapes, like I was just showing you. And then the, we represent our data that way. So our data becomes what's called a tensor for each time, uh, for each, let's see if I can do this right, <laughs> for each sensor, uh, for each step, for each wafer, we fit this curve and we get the parameters of the curve and how well it fits. And so we change our data to the summary that means much more to the um, engineer. And then after that, you can do anything you want using any black box method you like. But the, we've already transformed it to this much more interpretable, usable space that really characterize uh, the misbehavior or good behavior of our semiconductor system. So, um, so we have this huge tensor we make, and we follow all the, ref the wafers, and we characterize them that way. And um, so we're using this parametric equation and re-representing our data that way. Okay, and oh, more math, I'm sorry. But um, so the cool thing is, is when you do this fitting, you actually get an anomaly detection model. So when you fit the data, what you do is you fit, you fit a, a bunch of wafers to, together, um, and you start with ones that you think are kind of normal, this group. And then you get a model, and the first term of the model just tries to fit the parameters with a, a, a Gaussian, just a normal error. And, and it's trying to fit them. And then the second term here, what it's doing is it's trying to um, make, make a model of how the parameters vary. So from this model, we get part of it that characterize how well, uh, what's the shape of this um, wafer at this time? What's the shape of its signals? But it's also got this other second part of that model that actually says, how weird is this shape? So we get, do you fit well? And how weird are you, right? Because you can be, a, a, a wafer can be bad in two ways. It could be that, um, it just doesn't fit the model. It doesn't have the right data. Like you have a sensor failure or something like that. It's just not going to fit. It's going to be all noisy. It's going to be messed up, right? And that would be bad. That would be obviously bad to other things. But a much more subtle problem is if you have a weird shape, right? Like for instance, um, there's some changes that are normal and we see a lot, and there's some changes that are rare, and we need to know that differences. So for instance, the data tends to shift because everything's variable length, so the further you are in the process, the more you tend to shift. So shifting in your x or shifting over in time is no big deal. There's a lot of variance in that. But maybe for that process, you know, the, um, the level of how much it oscillates, the frequency, is very well defined, and if that thing deviates from that, that's a big deal. Or if you're trying to hit a set point and you miss the set point, that's a big deal. So it actually learns which parts of the parameter space are weird and it gives you an anomaly score based on these parameters that make stuff sense to the engineer. Okay, and then once you have this, you can re-parameterize the problem. So this is actually, um, looking at a whole bunch of uh, wafers that are generated over a quarter. And um, so we're looking at, for uh, this particular uh, tool and recipe, we're looking at all these different parameters. The omega is like the frequency and the amplitude, and we have an anomaly score, and all these different parameters. And we're just drawing a heat map of it so you can see what's going on. And you can clearly see that it shifted right here, right? There was a change. So in this parameter space, you can clearly see what's going on, and you can even see what changed, right? This one from blue to red, you know, whatever that is, right? Um, 
So this becomes the space for our, our system to do our anomaly detection. I should watch my time. OK, and then it turns out if you, so we have systems that automatically define these change points. And if you look at the gradient across the change, you can actually characterize what's going on. You can see what's important. Like you can say, well, this is the shape signatures before the change point, And this is the shape signatures after. This is our, we, we call this our normal model. This was fit. This is like how it expects it to look in a little, and it knows how much it shifts. And you can see like quite a big shift. Like now we're getting much more oscillations here. And we've actually changed the, you know, shifted it up. So we can act exactly characterize what the change was. OK, so these are our shape signatures. This is how we characterize it. Now we're going to embed this in, a, in an automatic system that diagnoses the faults. And um, so once again, this is providing real-time multivariate anomaly detection and diagnosis and, uh, based on this streaming data. And I'm going to show you results for 28 and 14 nanometers for a few different rep uh, a few different systems. And this system is completely unsupervised. Uh, it, it actually self-tunes and adjusts itself. I don't have time to go into that. But it uses unsupervised learning techniques to actually tune itself up to the problem. And um, you can adopt it to, to different uh, recipes and chambers and stuff. It will self-adapt. And we use just the metrology, which is the ground truth. We just use that to validate. And um, uh, so. And then what it's going to do is it, I'm going to show you how it produces like an automatic diagnosis report for the um, engineer to look at so they can understand. And it's actually an executable notebook that has all the data. Because remember that engineer spent a week formatting his data. This thing says, I found a problem. Here's your data. You want to delve in. Here it is. I've got data structures all set up for you. I've done this preliminary analysis. This is where I think it is. You know, we can write the text. You know, someday I'd like it just to give the paper. You know, I could just give, explain it, give the talk to management for you. Could be good. OK. So we have this um, anomaly identification, identification for process monitoring online framework. And it's online. It makes automatic diagnosis. It's automated. It's modular. So you know, you don't like how we did our anomaly detection. You want to use deep learning? Just replace that component. You know, go ahead. You can do it however you want. <laughs> so you have your streaming data. These features from shape signatures get constructed, and then you put it in an anomaly detector, and then it actually uh, produces a diagnosis report for the user. And this is done real time in the process. And the part that I'm not going to talk about, but I'll just tell you that there, is before the process, there's actually a whole automated thing that um, tunes it all up and picks all the parameters and decides what to do. So that's actually part of this process this tuning, which is really important because, you know, um, I can't be having a data scientist do this for all the 55,000 files. You know, I need to do it once and, and have it applicable in new, um, new processes. OK. And uh, once again, I'll repeat that the, the data is a tensor, right? And um, so for each sensor, for each step, we have the shape signatures that capture what's going on. And um, so we have this tensor, and we actually flatten the data, and then we do our analysis on it for each step. And this, there's, this is all the process data that tells on what's going on. And the data I'm going to show you here is for like uh, three different processes. Um, and you know, there's thousands of wafers. And there's, you know, uh, we're doing about, uh, we're doing what, uh, 13 chambers or something, different chambers, three different processes for you know, tens of thousands, 40,000 different wafers. OK, and this is how it works. So um, the, the results I'm going to show you here was from our, our first generation system. So we actually just use PCA to do our anomaly detection. It actually works really well. And the reports here are really simple shape signatures. They're just the mean. We just take the mean of the process. And what happens is you build a normal model. You use it to classify um, wafers. Uh, as being abnormal or not. If you see something weird, you trigger a change, and then you, say, and then you generate a diagnosis report. And then you update the normal model and repeat. So it's actually continuously generating a model of what's going right now. And if it detects a change, it fires and makes a report. And that's what's going on here. This is the monitoring value. In this case, it's produced by Hotelling's T-squared and PCA, but it could be from your deep learning net, if you can make one that can use not very much data. And it says, oh, I'm running red. And oh, I got a green. Things have changed. 
I'm going to restart, and I'm going to start with this blue guy. So it's actually detecting changes and then resetting itself down. So this is like, it's like, this is weird. I'm going to reset myself. This is weird. I'm going to reset myself. So um, it does this automatically. Uh, so yeah, I guess this is the same slide, but it's the same idea. You can see these are normal. We got too many abnormal. We reset, and we trigger a change. Now we make a diagnosis. And we actually can look at what's going on before and after, and we can look at how the features change in the space that the um, engineer understands, and we can generate these reports. And the report is done automatically. It actually generates an R notebook that is executable with all the data and the data structures that they need for analysis. I guess we're not. Um, and it produces the port. It gives all the visualizations. It will actually show you the features that it thinks are associated with that, that they localize which sensors at what points of time do I think that my anomaly is occurring for. And it, will, uh, and it actually runs a statistical test to validate this, to prove like, yeah, these ones really are significantly changing. You should worry about that. And it helps guide them through the process of understanding this. And, and right now, we're writing this report for the lead engineer kind of person. But you can imagine changing this and or, uh, oriented to a technician. But you'd have to present the data in different ways. But it'd be the same information that we just collected, but you would, you would show it in a way that met their needs for whatever job they had to do on the factory floor. OK, so I'm going to give you some examples of results. And, uh, um, so we find anomalies in sensors. We find steps that are messed up. We find steps in a row that are messed up. And we have whole subsystems that are messed up. So I'll give you an example. So this is an example. And you can see this monitoring value says, oh, you're messed up. And here it's looking at this throttle valve, which is letting in you know, horrible gases that are bad for you but are good for etching. Um, it, uh, it's, it's detected this change. It went from here, and now it's come down from here. And you can see that this is throttle valve at this step. And the steps have names, so I can't show them to you. But you can see that the throttle valve is gummed up. Something's weird with the throttle valve. And um, so we can uh, point out, we've, de we've detected which, which sensor and which steps are affected, and why, why are they weird, right? OK, this is another one. Um, so in this one, you know, once again, we see this monitoring value spike. And we look at the temperature. And it was over here. And now it's, it's here. The temperature's messed up. And we're seeing all this uh, power subsystems. So we have, they measure in different ways. We have temperature. Um, temperature is the result of the power, right? Current is uh, a measure of power. Power and voltage, these are all measures of power. And it's saying, you know, in steps one and two, I'm, or I'm, Steps 10 and 6 and 7, I'm not liking that. So it's saying, there's something up with your power subsystem. You should check it out. All right, and we do statistical validation. I probably don't care about this. But you can actually test and see that there are changes. So we also apply statistics and do an analysis so they can find you know, what's significant, what should you pay attention to. Um, we really think this is a problem. All right, and then we have the report, which I already showed you. OK, whoops, am I going backwards? I got it twice. OK, so um, looking at this, so the last, there's a couple more pieces of the project. Um, these are more like speculations. I haven't done this. I've done this for population health. I haven't done this for the fab. But uh, what you have to remember at the fab scale, we need to do what we just did. But I did this for one machine for three recipes. I have to do this for hundreds of machines. and hundreds of recipes that are changing all the time. So I need an AI system that's going to help me with that process. It's going to help the engineer set this up. And so we call this AI system semantically target analytics or semantalytics. And its goal is to automate the full life cycle of producing these models, designing them, implementing the process, and producing these diagnoses. So we don't want a one-off system. We want it to produce this for different recipes, different times. And, and what you got to realize is that every recipe that di is different, but they're all kind of the same. But they're just a little bit different. So what we do is we use semantics uh, to encode, capture, and isolate the domain knowledge needed for this process, this workflow we've developed. And we actually divide it into cartridges. We represent the domain knowledge that we need in the cartridges. And then we, um, we, we represent the domain knowledge we need. You know, Like this is this kind of machine. It has this kind of sensors. The sensors 
are based on, um, you know, these are the ones that are power, these are the ones that are on temperature, that are the, the other process, the result of the process, and so we can characterize it. And we have a recipe. The recipe has standard steps. You know, this is a bake step. It's going to uh, go like this, you know. So um, we capture all that information, and then we modularize it so that you can just plug it into this framework. So you're going, whoops, I just not quite getting this. So you, what you're going to do, so you have here, these are going to capture the property of the environment and the recipe. And the process, this would be the recipe that you're using. And then you have these model, like how do you need to analyze this data? And then this, these drive this process, this ATMOF process. It provides all the information it needs to apply this to new things. So if I want to do it to a new process and to a different machine, maybe all I have to do is change the sensors. Or if I do a recipe, I just have to change the recipe when I'm, I'm using on an existing machine. So it's kind of a plug and play architecture where we capture in a, a knowledge graph using ontologies in a standard vocabulary what's going on, what needs to be done, what's the environment. And then it also takes the results and makes an output cartridge. And this output cartridge is actually what drives that, um, that automated report, right? It has all the information needed for the automated report. And then you can actually uh, design the output. It gets written back to the knowledge graph, and then the knowledge graph is used to produce the diagnosis reports. And like I said, you could also model, have cartridges of, on who's using this data, right? So if I'm using it to a technician on a floor who's just specializing in this one machine, I might present the information one way. And if I'm giving it to the engineer who's trying to debug a complex problem, I might do it another. So we could actually also use this semantalytics to model our user and think about how do we make different presentations of the data for different people. Um, so that's Semantalytics, and we have done this, I don't have results for, I haven't, I haven't done it at the FAP, but we do this for population health. So when people have to do studies, like imagine you're doing electronic healthcare records and you're doing precision medicine, and you want to say for people with this genotype, what happened? You know, did they respond well to this drug? Well, then it would just go run the analysis for you, um, you know, and produce a report for the doctor or the patient, and it would um, enable you to, uh, specify, you know, if you change genes or, or diseases, it, it's easy to do. Okay, and uh, so, um, so this, we actually are developing ontologies. We need a manufacturing ontology that will um, enable common representations across tool and metrology types. Actually, I think there's some of the effort at that at the industry level, um, but it, and it will capture all the sensor, sensor, recipe, tool. It needs to know about maintenance because that changes the state. It needs to know about testing information. It needs to know about um, metrology. It defines these causal models that we need to interpret it, and it defines the workflow. Um, it customizes the diagnosis for the intended user. Uh, all the pieces are interoperable, reusable. You can, you can change them for different things. And then eventually you could use this to drive a cognitive, uh, an artificial agent who could interact with the person. Maybe you guys could design that for me because I haven't done that. But, you know, make some agent could take this knowledge graph and, you know, talk with the person and help them diagnose it. Okay, and then you can imagine too that it also encoded the full process, the faults. If you capture what happens after uh, they looked at it and what they responded to that fault, you could actually do a recommendation system based on this because you've collected all this data about what were the faults, what happened, and you know, what was their diagnosis and what was the response. So you could use reinforcement learning based on the system to recommend what actions should you take. Okay, and we also are using deep learning. So this is actual... Uh, um, this is uh, this swirly back. This is this multi-process thing. So the, the system I've shown you before only does one sensor at a time. That's a limitation. So we're investigating using dip, deep learning so we can do multiple sensors and understand their relationship. Because that, actually, that's at the heart of the um, uh, at the heart of the problem, right? We have the control variables and the process variables, and you kind of have an idea of their relationship. So we are using deep learning to try to under model that, and we want to design deep learning methods that know about the engineering and know about these control sensor systems and build that into them so they're smart, but, um, but yet they can handle the relationships that we don't understand. So we need kind of a hybrid. 
Okay, and this is, this is my student's thesis right now. So he actually takes the, the data from many chambers at once, and he runs them in an autoencoder, and this makes an encoding, and he also uses a metrology, and he puts this in this neural net, and um, it does nonlinear anomaly detection. And then he also gets a, to do some diagnosis by um, using like techniques like Lyme that do post hoc diagnosis of the neural net. So we are using deep learning, but it's also very rooted in the engineering control systems and our representation. So it kind of does both. So the last thing I have to say is, um, okay, so I think the future of AI systems at the fab level is that you would have artificial agents that would help you with this entire process, right? And um, so uh, the way you can do this is by using a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so I've talked about some parts. I just want to remind you of all the parts. The first thing is that we need a gray box approach. We do not want to ignore all of engineering. It has very valuable information. So we actually build that into how we represent the problem and model it and detect anomalies. So that's um, you know, the gray box knows about the white box mechanistic models, and it knows about deep learning and just finding correlation, but it does both. Um, we have this framework that provides automatic uh, workflows that goes from soup to nuts, right? You set up the problem, it runs, it self-tunes, it finds anomalies, it writes reports. And by combining this framework with semantics and representing things in an ontology, then we can represent this and make it very adaptable to different parts of the factory, different machines, different processes, right? So we really need the semantics too. We need that ontology. We need that representation, right? We don't want to do the same work over and over again. So this enables us, the semantics plus the framework, plus the representation, allows us to rapidly deploy quality control for new tools and process re recipes with minimal human intervention, right? And it, in fact, it can do much more. Because it has this control theory, you can actually re in re reverse engineer and make suggestions on how to fix things. Like, you know, you're, uh, um, you should, you're, you're oscillating too fast, dial back on KP, you know, you need to do that. Okay, and then for when we don't have enough information and we need to punt a little bit, then we can use deep learning to model complex relationships across the tools, sensors, and metrology that maybe we don't understand and we don't have enough information for. So we really use all four. So we've got um, mathematical model, AI, machine learning, and semantics all together. And ultimately, I think this will be embedded with intelligent agents working with the engineer as they set up the process and also um, keep the process running and do quality control and diagnose it. So that's... Thank you very much, Christine, for the, this cement analytics synthesis. Maybe a new trademark. <laughs> On a time, peut-être, pour une ou deux questions. One or two questions before the lunch. Uh, I talk, you're really hungry. Peut-être, vous allez au micro. Thanks, that was very interesting. I'm just curious about uh, what was the most uh, challenging aspect of this whole uh, great project. Uh, what was the most challenging? Um, uh, Maybe besides data. Yeah, okay, uh, so easily. Any cleanup. machine learning project for me is a representation. If you have a good representation, then life gets easier. So we had to come up with a tensor, we had to come up with a shape signature, and then you can start using existing methods. But really, learning how to think about the problem and translate it to a machine learning model, that's the hard part. And then there's all kinds of models we can pick from after that. Thank you so much. It's, it's really an impressive work. Congratulations for that. I, I was wondering if uh, the type, especially for the gray box, do you think it's easily transferable to other industries like anyone that uses uh, PIDs, for example? I uh, certainly, I mean, there is, um, the simulations are just like random PIDs we made up, right? I mean, it's any PID. So potentially 45% of all industry that use PID could use this. And, and uh, I also think it's not just an ID for controllers. I mean, you should use it on an airplane. 
You should have a model of how your airplane's running. In fact, we have a Professor Carlos um, uh, Varelas, I'm saying his name wrong. He, uh, he does this, you know, so you should have that simulation and, and, and a model, and if you can compare your fit to the model, then you have a lot of information. So in general, I think this whole gray box thing needs to be pushed in many domains. And it's kind of a silo thing, right? Just like we have the silo between, you know, deep learning and cognitive big AI people, uh, or, you know, we have a silo between mathematical modeling and uh, machine learning and data science. And we really shouldn't have that. We should really be using that information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for inviting me.